Microservices, they're small applications, independently deployable, each is solving a specific problem and they're all decoupled from each other. But you already know those things because you're watching this channel and you probably saw this video that talks about microservices architecture and then you saw the recent one that talks about communication between services. And communication is the key in decoupling services. If you want them to be independent from each other, if you want them to be decoupled, then you cannot do direct communication because, hey, how will you communicate between services directly if they're unaware of each other? We need a different solution and that's what we are going to explore today. We are going to use Dapper to enable event-based communication between services without them being even aware that the rest of the system, the rest of the services exist. So let's dive right into it. This is what we are going to do today. We are going to create three microservices or three applications, application one, application two, and application three. One will be in charge of publishing material like videos, podcasts, blogs, and so on and so forth. The second one will tweet about the material that was published in a system. And the third one will convert speech to text. Now, none of those three applications, none of those three services will be aware of each other. They will all have independent lives, not knowing that the rest of the system exists. They will be worlds by themselves and they will be isolated. That will allow us to work on each of those services independently from each other. And each of those applications can have a small team in charge of them and none of them will need to wait for the other people from the other teams for other releases of other applications. So three applications developed deployed and running independently of each other without being aware of the existence of the rest of the system. That's how microservices should work and that's what we are going to do today. Let me output a manifest that contains everything that I will need for my applications today. I will have three applications as I already mentioned and the first one defined here is speech to text it is a typical Kubernetes deployment. There is nothing special about it. There is nothing extraordinary except maybe the three annotations, which I'm going to ignore for now because we are going to talk about them later. Actually, there is one thing special. There is no service and without service, none of the other applications, none of the other processes in my cluster will be able to communicate with this application with speech to text. So no service, no communication. Even if you want to send a request to this application, you cannot do that because in Kubernetes, you cannot communicate between different pods without having a service. And this one doesn't have it. That's what makes it special. Then we have the second application called tweet. You can guess what it does because I already mentioned it. It will tweet about the material published somehow somewhere in the system. It is a deployment. It doesn't have a service and there is nothing special about this one either. It's almost the same as the previous one and it does have those annotations but again I'm ignoring those as if they do not exist for now. And we have a third application or third deployment which will be in charge of publishing material somewhere. Somehow it is following the same pattern. It is a deployment. It has a few annotations which I'm ignoring and unlike the other two this one does have a service. And the reason why this one does need a service is because we will be communicating with that one as humans, right? So I will be sending requests to that application, to the third one, to the one called publications to upload a video or a blog post or a podcast. So this is humanly accessible application and those do need services, but the other two do not. So you'll see. You'll see, it's going to be amazing. Just remember for now, three applications and only one of them will be accessible somehow within the rest of the system or in this specific case by me 
by sending requests to it. Moreover, there is no other relation between those applications. I'm having them in the same file just for simplicity reasons, but those three would be in different repositories managed by different teams, completely unaware of each other. So I'm going to apply the definition by executing kubectl dash dash namespace production. I want to apply something defined in the file apps YAML, and you can see that I got three deployments created in the production namespace and only one service. Only one of them is accessible in any form or way. The other two are completely, fully isolated. Next, I will wait until those three applications roll out. So kubectl roll out status deployment one, and then the other one, and then the third one. Now all three of them are confirmed to be up and running, and we can test it out. We can see whether my applications work, whether some magic is happening that will somehow tie those three together without them being connected between each other in any form or way. Next, I will retrieve the IP of the load balancer that was created through that single only service that I have. And then I will send one request to add a video to my system. So remember, I'm communicating with the publisher service. And then I will send a second request, CURL request to add a podcast episode. And finally, I will send a third request to add a blog post to the system as well. So I sent requests to add three types of content. There are different types of content, video, audio, which is podcast, and text, which is a blog post. And that worked so far. So one of the three applications is working. It can accept requests and do something with them. Now, what about the other two? I have the second service that is tweeting about the material that is being created inside of the system. And I have a third one, but let's focus on the one that sends tweets. To see what's happening, I will output the logs of that application. And here I can see that it processed all three types of materials, the video, the podcast, and uh, the blog post. So it figured out somehow, without knowing anything about the publisher service, that those types of materials were created and it sent tweets, tweeted about it. It promoted all that material, in this case, to Twitter. Now, before we continue, let me say that this is a fake application. It's not really tweeting because if you're following along, I don't want you to go into a trouble trying to figure out how to connect those applications to your Twitter account and so on and so forth. So it is a dummy service that simulates the principles that I'm trying to explain. Now, how did this happen? How did this application know that another application created videos and podcasts and uh, blog posts without that publisher application ever sending requests to this one. Without direct communication, I must have used something else. And I did, and it's awesome, but we're going to get there in a few minutes. For now, I want to double check what is happening with the third application, the one that converts speech to text. Now, this service also figured out that something was created, that some material was created in the new system, and it converted my video into speech to text, into text, and it converted the podcast into text, but it ignored the blog because there is nothing to convert to text, right? The blog is already text. So it somehow understood that uh, things were created and it understood that it should work with video and audio, but it should ignore blog posts because they shouldn't be created to text. They are already text. Well, the magic ingredient, which I mentioned briefly before, is Dapper. Dapper is what made all this happen. Dapper converted loosely coupled services that are unaware of each other into a system that works. And in this case, it works based on events. Events is the key. So let's explore Dapper or at least part of Dapper that is in charge of combining all this through events. Dapper stands for Distributed Application Runtime. And it helps with quite a few things related 
to application development, especially if we are focused on microservices. It makes it easy for developers to build resilient and distributed applications. Those applications can be stateless or stateful. Not only the Dapper doesn't care whether it's one or the other, but it helps us with both of those, even though in different ways. Applications that are using Dapper can run anywhere. They can run in Kubernetes, like what I'm doing right now, but they can run also in cloud, in virtual machines, in edge computing, etc., etc., etc. It can run almost anywhere. And that makes it awesome. Even though I'm primarily focused on Kubernetes, being able to use Dapper between legacy applications running somewhere else and then Kubernetes applications and maybe serverless applications and so on and so forth is absolutely amazing. And finally, you do not need to change almost anything in the way how you write your applications because Dapper can be used with applications written in any language. There are SDKs for some languages and even if there is no SDK, you can easily use Dapper just by sending requests to certain endpoints, which I will show in a second. So what does Dapper do? Well, a lot of things. It enables service to service invocations. It helps with managing state. It allows us to use pub sub model, which is what I've been using in this demo so far. It enables resource bindings. It implements actors model. It helps with observability. It helps with secrets and uh, we can use it to configure quite a few other things. And the best thing with Dapper is that it implements and integrates with almost anything. So let me tell you what those integrations are. And I'm going to do that very quickly, very, very quickly. So we have SDKs for C++, Go, Java, JavaScript, .NET, PHP, Python, and Rust. We can use quite a few state stores like AirSpike, Apache Cassandra, Couchbase, HashiCorp Console, Hazelcast, Memcached, MongoDB, MySQL, PostgreSQL, Redis, RitinDB, ZooKeeper, AWS, DynamoDB, GCP Firestore, Azure Blob Storage, Azure CosmoDB, Azure SQL Server, Azure Table Storage, and OCI Object Storage. We can do name resolutions with HashiCorp Console or MDNS or Kubernetes, which is what I'm doing today. We have pop some brokers like Apache Kafka, Hazelcast, NQTT, NAT Streaming, In-Memory, JetStream, Pool Server, RabbitMQ, Redis Streams, AWS, SNS, RSQS, GCP Pop Azure Event Hubs, Azure Service bus. And we have bindings for Apple push notifications for Chrome, Scheduler, GraphQL, HTTP, InfoDB, Kafka, Kubernetes events, Logos, Storage, NQTT, MySQL, PostgreSQL, Postmark, RabbitMQ, Redis, SMTP, Twitter, Twitter, SendGrid, Alibaba Cloud, Link Talk, and Cloud OSS, and Cloud Table Store, and then AWS, DynamoDB, S3, SES, SNS, SQS, Kinesis, and GCP Cloud PubSub, and Cloud Bucket, and Azure Blob Storage, CosmoDB, CosmoDB, Gremlin API, Event Grid, uh, Event Hub, Service Bus, Service Bus Queues, uh, Signal R, Storage Queues, and then finally, ZB Command and ZB Job Work. And I'm just getting started. There is also support for secret stores like Local Manifinals, Local File, Cash Call, Kubernetes Secrets, AWS Management, AWS SSM, Parameter Store, GCP Secret Manager, Azure Keyboard, and Alibaba Cloud OS Parameter Store. We can use Redis as configuration store, the only supported. And finally, we can combine it with middleware like Red Limit, OAuth 2, Bitter Without Line Credentials, Bare Network, Voice Agent, and uppercase. Now, if that did not blow your mind, then wait for it because I am going to explain how I managed to run my services in the first place in the demo that I showed like a few minutes ago, five minutes ago. So how did I manage to make my applications work together even though they're completely oblivious about the existence of the others and they do not even have services that would enable them to talk to each other? Well, the key is in the setup that I did before I started this demo. And all I did was install Dapper in my cluster and use Redis. I installed Redis as well, even though Redis is not the only, as you already saw in the integration section, you know, the huge one, Redis is not the only tool that we can use to store the events and store the information, but that's what I use today. So I already installed those in my system and then I applied this manifest that has two resources. Both of those are Dapper components, but of different types. The first one is state Redis type that tells Dapper where to store the state. And I just told it to go to Redis to store the state of whatever is going on in my system. And the second component is of type pub sub redis and that's more or less the same one as the previous one except that this time i'm telling dapper that whenever somebody wants to publish an event or listen for events the storage should be redis just as the storage i defined above so i'm telling dapper hey events go to redis it could be something else but today it's redis now let's go back to the manifest and take a look at those annotations because they're the key to everything. They're all the same and they all follow the same pattern. In speech to text, for example, we have Dapper IO enabled set to true 
app id set to speech to text and app port 8080. First I enabled Dapper. I told Dapper that I wanted to attach to that application, to the container, to the pod of that application. I gave it a specific ID so that it can identify requests or listeners coming from that application. And I told it what is the port through which uh, the application is accessible and in this case only and exclusively to Dapper. The same thing is happening with the second one, with the tweet. The only difference is in the ID. And finally, we have the third application, which again follows exactly the same pattern with a different ID. That's all I did on the level of the definitions of the applications. Now let's take a look at the code of the publisher first, because publisher is different. Publisher is announcing what it did. It is creating events. I wrote it in Go, but the logic is more or less the same, no matter which language you choose. The logic of the application and the way how you write application is the same. It doesn't matter really. It is independent from Dapper. And the only thing we need to do in case of using an SDK, and remember, you can do all those things without an SDK, is to initiate a new client and to say, hey, I want to publish the event. I want to announce what I just did and pass some information like the name of the PubSub service, the topic, which in this case is blog, and pass some data, whatever data you want. That's all there is to it. That's the only thing that I put on top of whatever code I already had for that application. The speech to text application, the second of the three, is following a different route. It is not publishing anything, but it is subscribing to events from services it knows nothing about. And in this case, I'm iterating through all the topics that I think that this one should subscribe to, which in this case is videos and podcasts, but not blogs, because there is nothing to convert to text. Blogs are already text. And then I'm creating a new subscription with the specific name of the publisher, the topic I wanted to subscribe, and the route. Then I'm adding a topic handler that will handle the events coming from PubSub, which in this case is Redis. And finally, I start the whole process. I start listening to those events handled by those handlers. And the handler itself in this case is very simple. It is just outputting the information of the events on the screen. In a real world situation, I would indeed pass it through the speech to text service, but this is a silly demo. So I'm not doing anything except outputting the information so that you can see that I'm really receiving those events that I subscribed to. I will not even show you the third service because that's the same as this one. The only difference is that unlike the speech to text service that subscribes only to two out of three types of events, the Twitter service is tweeting about everything. So it is subscribing to all event types. So how does all that work? How did I get there or what is happening behind the scenes to be more precise because you already saw the code the code is extremely simple there is almost nothing for you to do but behind the scenes when i created the pods of the publisher application dapper automatically added an additional container that handles all that logic of uh, subscribing to events and publishing events. And the same thing happened with tweets and speech to text. In both cases, Dapper injected a container that is handling all the communication, all the logic. And then I already had in my system, in my cluster, Redis that is acting as an event bus. So event bus is uh, storage for all the events and we can publish events to that storage and we can subscribe and listen for events on that storage. Applications themselves have no idea that Redis exists. That's not their concern. They're decoupled, they're isolated. They only know about themselves. As such, publisher is just saying, hey, here's an event. I just did this. I just uploaded a video or I created a blog post or I uploaded a podcast episode and that information automatically goes to Dapper container and Dapper is figuring out what to do with it. And in in case of the publisher, it is sending that information to event bus. It is publishing the information like, hey, there is a new video. I do not know who should do something with it, what should be done with it. That's not my concern. My concern is only to publish the information that the application passed to me.
and in case of tweets and speech to text, Dapper is listening for the events and if there is an event with a specific topic that the application is subscribed to, Dapper is passing that event to the application itself so that application can do whatever needs to be done when a specific event was created. In this case by publisher, but it could be by any other application in the system. So we have three applications in this case. In a real world scenario, we would have many more. Some of them are publishing events, some of them are listening to events, some application might be doing both, both publishing and listening to events, and none of those applications is aware of anything else in the system. They're just saying, hey, I have something to publish, Dapper, you take care of it, I do not even know that you exist, but I trust that you will take care of publishing this event, or I trust that you will forward the requests to me when they come from specific events. Dapper is one of those tools or frameworks that blow my mind, right? Usually I'm very critical and I find good and bad things in absolutely everything I use and I review and so on and so forth. But Dapper is one of the few tools that just clicks immediately. So I, I, I immediately said, yes! This is what I need. It is absolutely amazing and it is becoming some sort of de facto standard because so many vendors are adopting it and we can see through integrations that almost everybody is on board and Dapper is on the path of becoming an official standard of how we design communication between microservices but it doesn't have to be microservices. Any type of application should be able to leverage the advantages we get through Dapper. Now in this video I explored only pub sub capabilities of Dapper. There's so much more and if you would like me to explore some other aspect of Dapper just let me know in the comments and I will gladly do that because you know Dapper is actually huge. It's massive. I could not explore it in a single video. So what are the pros? I mean there are many but what I really like, one of the things I like the most is that it provides almost everything we need to manage our applications and especially dynamic decoupled microservices. It is almost completely decoupled from code. The only coupling, the only thing that your application should be aware of is the Dapper SDK, but even that is not mandatory. You could just send or subscribe to events without that SDK. So it's not real coupling. It's more that Dapper SDK is an optional thing that helps a lot but it is definitely not mandatory. And finally, the last that I will mention as a big advantage, which is definitely not the only one, there are many, many other things, but the one I really, really like is integrations. It integrates with almost anything. So almost any tool you use to store the state, to monitor, to do this and that can be combined with Dapper and that's absolutely amazing. Now, the only negative thing, the only thing that is potentially a problem or to be more precise, confusing, is overlap with service meshes. There are things that are specific to Dapper, there are things that are specific and unique to service meshes, but there are also some features that overlap between the two and it might be complicated to make a decision, hey, should I use Dapper or should I use microservices or should I use both? You should probably use both, but then you need to decide which feature should be used by whom. For example, one of the features that Dapper provides is uh, TLS communication, and that is something that we get with service meshes as well. So you need to figure out, hey, if you use both, should you enable TLS in one or the other or both? You shouldn't do it in both, so you need to figure out which one is better suited for that. So it might be confusing to pick between Dapper and Service Mesh. They serve different purposes, but there is overlap and then if you use them both, you need to figure out which of the features you're going to use from each of those, among those overlapping features. Now that might be a potential candidate for a video, you know, differences between Dapper and Service Meshes and when you should use one or the other or both. If that sounds interesting, then let me know in the comments as well. And I will do my best to create yet another video. Until then, Thank you for watching and see you next time. Cheers.